Our guest tonight was formerly the Rivers Advocate for the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration, where one of his areas of expertise was riparian vegetation. Now he's playing the role of Johnny Appleseed for edible native species. He has a nursery where he grows and keeps over a thousand plants propagated from seed, some he collected himself, as well as obtained from other sources such as the Native Plant Trust. He's then partnering with land trusts, schools, colleges, government agencies, organic farms, tribal groups, and others to plant to plant plants from his nursery in appropriate places on their properties. Please join me in welcoming Russ Cohen. Hi, thank you, Carol, and hi, everybody, wherever you may be watching me from. I'm talking to you from Arlington, Massachusetts, which uh, let me uh, just uh, give my acknowledgement that I'm in the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts tribe. And of course, in New Hampshire, you've got different traditional tribal lands up there. So I want to acknowledge that and the continued presence of these peoples in our midst. And I want to give special thanks to one indigenous person, and that is Robin Welkimmer, who, since this talk is sponsored by a library, I have to talk about a book, this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is one of the best books I've ever read. And I strongly recommend it. <clears throat> and there's one section in particular I'd like to highlight that's relevant to tonight's talk. But before I do, I just want to uh, express my appreciation for indigenous peoples of this region in general for figuring out what plants were edible uh, hundreds, thousands of years ago. And that uh, information has trickled down to those of us that continue to eat plants. So I'm very grateful uh, that they had that figured out for us. So uh, thank you. And, uh, and anyway, so Robin has a section in her book called, Braid, uh, called uh, The Honorable Harvest which is uh, sort of like the 10 commandments of foraging. And she even suggests that people laminate this and put it in their pocket and carry it around with them whenever they're interacting with plants in the wild. And that would be a good idea to follow. Uh, I find these guidelines very useful, uh, although I'll have to say that for certain specific species, uh, I think even species specific uh, information that's, that goes beyond what she's saying here in general is useful, but the main um, message I want to carry forward from what Robin has written is the fact that um, it's a really good practice to use forbearance and restraint when you're foraging of native species, when you're picking native species from the wild, because native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food and some other portion, portion of their life cycle, so it's important to um, to not pick so much that you upset the ecological balance in any way. <clears throat> so that is native species, but, um, but depending upon the part of the plant you're harvesting, there are gonna be different impacts. For example, uh, <clears throat> berry picking and nut gathering. Those are relatively benign foraging activities because all you're doing is picking the seed dispersal portion of the organism. And often there's a lot of those around. If you gather some, it's not that big a deal. But if you are digging plants up to harvest them or stripping all the flowers, all the leaves up plants to harvest them, you can imagine that could be a lot more traumatic for the plant and for the animals that rely on that plant. So please bear that in mind. Okay, but at the other end of the spectrum are the invasive species. So uh, here's a book from Massachusetts. You've got the invasive plants in the Granite State by New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. That's a good guide. So this book uh, from Massachusetts and the overlap, what's invasive in Mass and what's invasive in New Hampshire is a pretty big overlap. So anyway, this book covers 66 of what are considered to be the most ecologically disruptive non-native plants that occur in Massachusetts. And the main bad thing invasive plants do is they usurp the habitat of the native species. They take it away from them. So, um, uh, so yes, so this book covers 66 species. So if there is a silver lining to the invasive cloud, it's perhaps the fact that some of these plants are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as at least most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. So it's guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too many of these, uh, provided that you don't spread them around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. <clears throat> so, and I have a bunch of tasty invasive species at the bottom left-hand corner of the page. We will be talking about several of those tonight. So I'd also lump into this category are really common weeds like dandelion, for example, which is in my show. Uh, it's not invasive because dandelions only occur where people are there, except there is one big exception 
uh, and actually people go there, it's the top of Mount Washington. Dandelions are concerned there in terms of uh, usurping the habitat of native species, but mostly dandelions are just, you know, in the vacant lot across the street along the bike path or along the edge of the school ball field, places like that where they're pretty harmless. And, uh, and as you can see, I really like eating them. We'll get to that in just a minute. So uh, yeah, so uh, do uh, use some forbearance and restraint when uh, gathering the uh, native species, but for the weeds and invasives, you can uh, be more relaxed about it. All right, so uh, I've organized the plants I'm talking about in the show by chronologically by foraging opportunities. So I'm starting in the spring. So we're actually past uh, the prime harvesting time for the first few plants in the show. And then gradually we'll catch up to this time right now. And then we'll quickly vault over that to times to look forward to in the late spring, early summer and into the fall. So let's start with this one. So um, I mean, those of you that are watching from New Hampshire, you're probably old pros at picking fiddleheads in the woods, but I find where I'm calling from in Eastern Mass, uh, there are some people that, that uh, don't know how to do that right. And a pretty common mistake that novice foragers make in Massachusetts is something like this, is they're walking woods in the spring and they see a bunch of ferns at the curled up fiddlehead stage and they say to themselves, oh, fiddleheads, boy, they look an awful lot for what I've seen for sale in the store. It must be the same thing. So they bring it home and they cook it up and they taste it and it tastes horrible. And they say to themselves, where we went wrong? But where they went wrong is they harvested the wrong species of ferns. I only know of two species of fern that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one. This is the ostrich fern. The, this is, in fact, the quote-unquote fiddlehead fern, the kind you see for sale in the stores. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I don't know anybody that's cultivating ostrich ferns as a crop. So if you are seeing ostrich ferns in a produce section of a store or on a restaurant menu, they were gathered from the wild. <clears throat> and unfortunately, uh, when, wild, when native plants like the ostrich fern, fern become commodified, they uh, sometimes trigger some unscrutable behavior in the part of people that are, are eager to make a buck off these native plants. And so um, the sustainable recommended method I uh, teach about gathering ostrich fern fiddleheads is one or maybe two of the cold up parts per clump. That's it, let the rest grow out. Uh, that's a sustainable way of interacting with this plant. But sometimes what the unscrupulous people do that are picking to sell is they'll pick every single fiddlehead. And scientific studies have proven you can actually kill the plant by harvesting it so hard. So one or two of the cold up parts per clump. And that's good. And, um, and since I mentioned, mentioned Native Americans, I have to share this one other concept, which is called traditional ecological knowledge, TEK. And sometimes it's embedded in indigenous language. And I recently learned this example having to do with the ostrich fern. So I learned this in Nancy Turner, who's an ethos, ethno, ethnobotanist actually out in the Pacific Northwest. But she made this comment that the Maliseet Indians of New Brunswick, and they're also in Maine, call ostrich ferns masos, which me, refers to the circling movement a dog makes as it dies down. Isn't that amazing? They uh, drew that parallel, you know, because here's a circling movement, here's a circling movement. And so, uh, um, yes, so there's in traditional ecological knowledge embedded in language. All right, so here's where you're most likely to see ostrich ferns in the wild, the alluvial floodplain soil uh, along uh, some of the bigger rivers like the Merrimack, for example, or the Connecticut River uh, on the New Hampshire Vermont border uh, as ostrich fern fiddleheads. And uh, then another thing that distinguishes the ostrich fern from other species of fern, so there's the vase shape that I wrote about earlier, is these fertile fronds, the spore bearing fronds. So if you cut these stems in cross section, they also form a U shape uh, like the fiddleheads do. Uh, they've got the gouge down the center like a celery stem. All right, so if you bought fiddleheads at the store and cooked them up and been not particularly impressed with them, you might want to try this method, which I learned from this naturalist, Beth Basler, who took a bunch of us to a fiddlehead catch along the Connecticut River, right on the Mass New Hampshire border. And this was um, several years ago, and she brought her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead catch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them, and they were truly exquisite that way. All right, so here's a plant I saw today. Uh, I taped a wild edibles walk that's gonna be part of a conference next month. And uh, this plant now in the greater Boston area is about two feet tall. So it's really past its prime for harvesting. I like to harvest it when it's this height, and that was about a month ago in the Boston area. And this is a plant called stinging nettle. 
And if you've never been stung by stinging nettle, it's not like poison ivy where you find out a day or two later you got into it, you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But on the good side, the sting rarely lasts for more than an hour and there are antidotes to it. So what am I harvesting to eat this plant? So I'm taking the top cluster of leaves from every plant like this right here, this right here, this right here, this right here. Uh, throw those in a plastic bag, bring them home, throw them in a big pot of water, stir it around just to wash them off. And then I'm taking some tongs and I'm flinging the washed nettle tops into the cooking pot, so I'm still not touching them. And then you just basically steam the nettle tops in the water that's still clinging to them from the washing process. It takes about five minutes and the nettle greens will shrink quite a bit. But at this stage, what that steaming does, it converts the chemical that caused a sting in the raw vegetable into a protein. So it makes the nettles about 7% protein, which is pretty high for leafy green vegetable. Plus nettles have all kinds of other vitamins, and minerals like calcium, it's the closest thing I know of to a vitamin pill in the plant world. It's really good for you. So steamed nettle greens, you could eat just plain if you wanted to, or you can incorporate them into different dishes like cream of stinging nettle soup. This recipe is in my book. It's very easy to make. It's just uh, taste some potatoes and onions and throw them in the blender with the steamed nettle greens and add the chicken stock if you're not a vegan and a half and half. And, um, and it's really good. And then here's stinging nettle balls. This is just a recipe from the 1950s. Uh, a spinach ball recipe where they're using Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. And you just substitute the steamed nettle greens for the uh, spinach that recipe works great. All right, I dropped this plant in the show at this point because this plant looks an awful lot like stinging nettle. But those of you that know something about plants might know that this is a member of the mint family. And uh, a couple of ways to tell is if you look at this stem right here, you'll see it's got four equal sides to it and the leaves are opposite from each other. They come across from each other on the stem. That's the characteristic structure of most plants in the mint family. So which mint is this? I'd ask you if this is a live program, but since it isn't, I'm just gonna tell you that this is catnip. The catnip does occasionally go wild. It has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day, and you can use the leaves fresh or dry either way. All right, so here is curled to curly dock. This is one of the antidotes to the stinging, stinging nettle. So you just find some dock leaves and just scrunch them up, get the juice out, and then apply that juice where you were stung, and it helps make the sting go away. So this is an edible plant, too. I will gather the tender leaves from the center of the plant, and I find them to be slightly bitter. So what I'll do is get a pot of water boiling in the stove, throw the dock leaves in there, and blanch them uh, for 20 seconds. That's it. And then that takes the bitterness away. And then you can use them just like cooked spinach. So one recipe that's really good for the blanched dock leaves is spanakopita, and the Greek spinach pie with the filo dough and the feta cheese is you can use the blanched dock leaves instead of the spinach. You can also use the steamed nettle greens instead of spinach in that recipe, it comes out great. All right, so this plant is at or near the top of the botanical blacklist. The ecologists really, really hate it. It forms monocultures pretty much to the exclusion of everything else. So it's definitely, um, um, deleterious to our native habitats, but it is very yummy. So what is it? It is Japanese knotweed. And Japanese knotweed blooms like this in the late summer, so look for that. And then in the spring, you're going to see the dried up bamboo-like stalks from last year's growth. And then in the midst of that, you'll see these shoots coming up, and that is this year's growth, and that's the early stage of that is what you eat. So when the stalks are about a foot tall, like on the left here, this is what I would call the wild asparagus substitute and you can just take this entire stock and steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite way to harvest the knotweed is I let the stalks get a little bit taller, like a foot and a half, two feet tall. And I pick the fattest sprouts I can find because I peel the very outer layer off uh, because it's stringy and that uh, skin can get caught in your teeth. So I peel that off, but the knotweed stalks are hollow. So you don't want to peel too deeply or all, all you've left is a hole. You just want to get that very outer left layer off and then you end up with this crisp green tube, which is tart and juicy. You can eat it right on the spot if you want. It's kind of like a Granny Smith apple, or you can chop it up as I've done in the bowl here and use that instead of rhubarb, which is related to this plant, in any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here is my strawberry knotweed pie that I love to make. And virtually everybody I've served this to say, this is even better than strawberry rhubarb pie, which is a very nice compliment. So, but you might be, and the recipes in my book, so you might be looking at this pie though and saying, I don't know, I'm a little intimidated by pie crust and that lattice work top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm gonna show you a way to use those peeled 
uh, not wheat pieces that requires no cooking skill whatsoever is you could just consider them a tart little edible container and you can fill it with like a flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse or something like that and have this delicious little uh, appetizer uh, that you can eat or serve the company. And I'm looking forward to feeding, inviting company over and serving them wild food again, which I, I hope to do in the very near future. All right, so here's garlic mustard, another hated invasive species. It's like this right now in the Boston area. So I suspect it's looking like this now in Nashua. I actually like to harvest this plant before this stage and it's the stems on the developing plant. So before it blooms or even before it really buds up, these stems I consider to be mild, mild enough to eat raw. The rest of the plant is kind of bitter, but the stems are mild enough to eat raw and you could chop them up and use them like broccoli instead of a stir fry. So garlic mustard. All right, here's a plant related to garlic mustard, also in the mustard family. This is wintercress, really common farm weed. And it's past the stage now in the Boston area. I suspect it is in uh, Nashua too, but it's uh, usually the very beginning of May is when you want to look for it at this stage, when you have these unopened flower buds that look just like broccoli florets and you have to boil them because the flavor is a little bit too strong to just steam them. But after you boil them for several minutes, the flavor is identical to broccoli rub, they're quite good. All right, were this a live program, I'd be asking the audience, what is this plant? And invariably somebody will chime in and say, Oh, that's phlox, they would be wrong. This isn't phlox and there's an easy way to tell. If you look carefully at the flowers, you can see the flowers on the plants in this photo have four petals. All phlox family flowers have five petals. This is actually a plant called Dame's Rocket. It is another member of the mustard family. This is considered an invasive species in Massachusetts. So uh, I assume it's not held in very high regard by ecologists in New Hampshire either. So it's a guilt-free foraging opportunity. So you can't pick too much in terms of, you know, uh, having an environmental impact. So you see how it comes in white and purpley. That's invariably how you see it in the wild, the two colors together. So it's an easy plant to identify at the distance. Although there are other parts of the plant that are edible, I tend to just eat the flowers because flowers are, it's fun to eat flowers. And although uh, the white flowers have the same flavor as the purple flowers, I tend to just use the purple flowers because purple is a funner color than white. So you could just eat these just plain, or you could use them to decorate other foods, add them to salads, whatever. They have kind of a sweet garlic and radishy flavor. They're quite good. All right, so this photo I took in New Hampshire, although you can probably guess not in Nashua. This is a scene I'm sure some of you have seen yourself. This is right off of Route 16, heading out of North Conway, heading north, just after you run the gauntlet of all the outlet stores, and you see this meadow, and off in the distance is the presidential range with snow on top because I took this photo over Memorial Day weekend, which showed you dandelions are blooming up there at that time. Of course, where we are, dandelions are blooming right now. And dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of wild plants than anything else in this. The reason is a story, something like this. It's the spring and you look out in your backyard and you see all these blooming dandelions. And you say to yourself, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you go out to your yard, you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on it. You take one bite. It's incredibly bitter. You spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, in my opinion, when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, it's really too late to be eating dandelions, except for the flowers, of course. But uh, my favorite part of the dandelion to harvest is before the flowers come out. And in fact, it is the unopened flowers, the dandelion flower buds, which I consider among my favorite vegetables, period, cultivated a while. They're like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. They're really good. And, um, and so what I do is pick the buds off the plant throw them in some water just to wash them off, stir them around real good, get a pot of water boiling the stove, throw the dandelion buds in there and cook them for 60 seconds. That's it, that's all they need. And then you can add them to soups and omelets and casseroles. But before you do anything with them, before you even add any salt or butter uh, on them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. And if you wanna gather dandelion leaves, in my opinion, this is the right time to do it when the buds are unopened. And as I'm picking the buds off the, the dandelion, if I see some tender, uh, leaves in there, I'll pick them too and prepare them the same way. All right, so this plant is a little bit out of chronological sequence, but this is a very close relative of dandelion called chicory. And chicory leaves are edible too in the spring or in the fall. In the summer, they're way too bitter to eat. Chicory flowers are edible. They don't have a lot of flavor, but blue is an unusual color. So it's fun to just snip the petals off and get them into a salad. But probably the thing that chicory is the most well-known for is roasting the roots to make a coffee substitute or additive. This is explained in my book, 
but basically you gather the roots, wash them up, uh, roast them slowly in an oven until they're brittle and aromatic, and then grind them up in a food processor and then brew a beverage from them. And I find I only need about half the amount of chicory grounds to make the same strength beverage as coffee grounds. And when you make that drink from chicory, it is amazing how much it tastes like coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory the same way, flavor is really similar. The one big difference is chicory does not have caffeine in it. So if you're one of these people that says, oh, what's the point of drinking it if there's no caffeine in it, then the chicory is just not gonna cut it for you. All right, here's chickweed, really common farm and garden week. It's at this stage right now. So um, I use it as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or a lettuce substitute in a salad. Violets are edible, they're, at, they're out right now. Violet flowers are edible, violet leaves are edible, raw or cooked, and the violet flowers you can use for decorating other things. You can also candy the violet flowers for decorating other foods. All right, since this is edible wild plants and mushrooms uh, program, I gotta talk about one spring mushroom, and that's the morel. Morels are maddeningly elusive to find in Eastern New England. Um, I find them a little bit more in the sweeter soils like in Western Massachusetts, Vermont, than I do in Eastern New England, like New Hampshire, Massachusetts. I did see some this year though, and I have had reports of other people seeing them. So maybe it's a good morale in the year, maybe you'll luck out. So here's the black morale. And this one I don't see way off in the wilderness somewhere. I usually see it right near people's houses, like right in the pea gravel by the foundation, or right by the shrubbery, uh, or by the walkways or in the mulch. So. The fact I've got a film canister in this photo for scale tells you I took this photo quite a while ago. Of course, uh, we don't use these anymore, but anyway, that gives you an idea of the size of these morels. So all these morels came from one person's yard uh, outside Boston. All right, but I have some good news for you. This photo right here was taken in Pepperell. So that's not far for you at all. So these are the yellow morels and uh, they are out right now. Uh, I have some actually down the street for me, a neighbor has them coming out in their yard, which is terrific. Where I tend to see these is underneath older apple trees or recently dead elm trees where the bark is still attached to the trunk of the tree and it hasn't slept off yet. And the time I find the yellow morels is now, this week. So, <laughs> um, so if you luck out, you know, check those places and you may be able to find them, I hope you do. And I'll be talking about mushrooms more in the show because the real main season for mushroom hunting in New England is middle of July to the middle of October. So uh, when we get to that point in the show, I'll talk more about mushrooms. All right, daisies are edible. The whole plant's edible, but the really tastiest part are the leaves before the flowers come out. So how do you recognize the plant then? This is what it looks like, and I apologize the photo's a little out of focus, but if you look at the flower bud, it has a flat top and it's got markings on it, kind of like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. So look for that, look for leaves that look like this. And daisy leaves can be so tasty that I've never cooked with them. They're just really great, excellent, just put right into a salad. Sheep sorrel, got a lot of acidic soil in New Hampshire, so uh, this plant shows up quite a bit. It's actually from Europe, but it's naturalized itself uh, in New England. It's a diminutive cousin of the French garden sorrel, so you can use it the same way as you can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it, and so on. And then um, uh, there is a plant called wood sorrel that I thought was in my show, uh, that some people call clover or sour grass. Uh, it's actually the oxalic daisy. It's not related to clover at all. It also has the oxalic acid in it and has this uh, uh, tart flavor. And that plant is, uh, uh, if you go into Northern New Hampshire, like in the White Mountains, you can find a native counterpart called the white wood sorrel, which has a beautiful white flower with the candy, uh, uh, candy stripes, little pink candy stripes on it. So anyway, the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in the sheep sorrel and the wood sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid, which is not good to eat in enormous amounts. Like if you ate a gigantic salvo full of just either or both of those plants, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium and it could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating in a moderation, it's perfectly fine. All right, now let's talk about this guy. So yes, this is the plant where the brown birds that get caught in your socks, your dog's fur in the fall. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from this plant and is appropriately enough called burdock. And the burrs aren't edible, but there are uh, several parts of the plant that are quite yummy. Um, this is what the plant looks like right now in the Boston area. So this uh, is appropriate photo. So let's talk about the root, which is one of the edible parts of the burdock. So burdock is a biennial, it has a two year life cycle. So it looks like this, most of the first year, the beginning of the second year, and then later on in the second year, it blooms and it dies. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. But to get the root, 
you have to dig up the plant. You, could, you can't just grab this foliage and yank on it and get a root out that way. You have to dig them up. And it's a lot of work. And I pretty much guarantee that your patients will give out before the roots do because the roots are very, very long. So let's say you dig and you dig and you just uh, cut off what you can reach and you get about a length's worth of root. And one easy way to cook it is just to wash it off. You don't have to peel it, slice into half inch thick rounds and boil it in salt and water till it's tender, which is, takes about 15 minutes and it will taste like a starchy artichoke, but I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, I wait for the second year's growth, the cylindrical flower stalk that emerges from the center of the plant. Uh, I would say this would be mid-June in Nashua. And I'll cut this at ground level and lop off the top cluster leaves and have a length of the cylindrical flower stalk about a foot and a half long. So you see all these I gathered in less than a half an hour on the edge of a farm, former farm down in the Boston area. Now the outer layer of the burdock stems are bitter and stringy, <clears throat> so you need to trim that off. But inside it's solid all the way through, so it's not hollow like the knotweed. It's solid. So even after you trim the outer layer off, you have can have pounds of uh, edible uh, raw material uh, there. So you can really fill up on burdock. So yes, yeah, so you chop those uh, peeled stalks in half inch pieces and boil it salt to water till it's tender about five minutes. And then it's a delicious vegetable, just plain or it's really good uh, thrown in spaghetti sauce or it's really good in the dish where ordinarily you would use artichoke hearts and Parmesan cheese and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs, mix it all together, bake it in the oven. It's a spread that you put on crackers where you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds for the artichoke hearts and that recipe, it works great. And there it is. So this recipe is actually on my webpage. It's not in my book, but it is, uh, on my webpage, and uh, I think the link has been dropped into the chat to where to find me. But just go to the recipes page and you should be able to find this. All right, so here's cat briar. So this time in the spring right now at the end of the woody vines is this tender young growth, which is edible raw. Um, you pop it right in your mouth or you could cook with it. But I have to tell you, there's a cousin of this plant. This is Smilex rotundifolia. I like a cousin of this plant, which is called cat briar. And this is a thornless herbaceous, uh, this one is called carrion flower, I'm sorry. Cat briar was one I just showed you. That's cat briar. This is carrion flower, this is the one I prefer. So it sends up these shoots that look just like asparagus, whoops, and you harvest them like asparagus, you prepare them like asparagus, they taste like asparagus, they're related to asparagus. So isn't that great? So why is the plant called carrion flower? So here we are camping, we're using a Frisbee as a plate, and some of the shoots we harvested had these little spherical balls in them. Those are the carrion flower buds. If we had encountered this plant like a week or so later, it would be a rather unpleasant experience because that's what the flower looks like when it blooms. And if you hold your nose right up to it, it smells like dirty gym socks or rotting meat. So it can be a rather unpleasant experience. But if you harvest the carrion flower shoots before they bloom, they're quite tasty. All right, so this is black locust, a species that is on the invasives list in Massachusetts. It does grow around Nashua and way up actually, uh, at least as far north as Jackson, Jackson, New Hampshire. So now you're seeing the, the bumblebee in the center of the photo and you might say, oh, I shouldn't pick those flowers, the pollinators need them. Well, yeah, the pollinators can visit them, but um, black locust trees get to be 30, 40, 50 feet tall and they're covered from top to bottom with the blossoms. So the pollinators can fly and visit them flowers in the upper branches and you can pick the flowers in the lower branches and there's plenty of flowers to go around and you can all chow down and have a great time. So uh, uh, black locust flowers smell like jasmine and they taste like sweet pea pods. So you just strip them off their central stalk and then just get a bowl of them here, which you could just eat just plain or add to salads. What I love to do with them is to make fritters from them. So here's the black locust fritters, this recipe is in my book. All right, pokeweed is edible. And let me just show you what you wanna look for. So it's not out yet. So we've gone past the time where we are currently, and now we're looking ahead to what the foraging opportunities are in the future. So this is the ideal stage to harvest pokeweed when it's about four to 10 inches tall. Don't harvest any of the root because the root's very purgative. Make sure you get just the green and growing part of the plant. And then you have to boil it for seven minutes to make it safe to eat. And then it's quite good and it won't shrink or get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. And you might say, all right, Russ, well, you say pokeweed is good, but I'm nervous. I'm looking at this shoot. I'm not seeing any distinguishing characteristic. I could possibly mix this up with something else. Uh, and the answer is you're right. But here is the really nice thing that pokeweed does for you. So pokeweed is an herbaceous perennial. So eventually gets four or five feet tall, produces these juicy, familiar looking, shiny purple berries, which aren't edible by the way. Uh, 
But when the plant dies at the end of the growing season, it will not rot away. It will just sort of blanch as a skeleton. And that stock typically rem rem remains uh, at the place where the pokeweed plant is and the perennial root will set up a new crop. And so you will see the new shoots coming up just at the spot where last year's shoot is still growing into the ground. And then you'll know for sure that these are pokeweed shoots. All right, so milkweed. I put this in the show right after pokeweed, even though the harvesting stage is a little bit later on in the season, because um, use the same cooking method for milkweed that you use for pokeweed is whatever milkweed part you're cooking, you boil it for seven minutes. So here you see, I call, this is a there's a chapter on pokeweed in my book. There's a chapter on milkweed in my book. And the subtitle of the chapter for milkweed is a procrastinating forager's dream food because there's at least four edible stages to the plant and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while for the next edible stage to develop. So this is actually what I'm showing here is edible stage three. These are the milkweed flower buds when they're in a tight green cluster. You boil them for seven minutes and they're quite good. Now, earlier than this were the milkweed shoots, which are out of my yard right now, and then the leaves off the slightly older shoots when the shoot itself is too tough to eat. Boil those for seven minutes, good vegetable. And then uh, you can see how well these milkweed buds in this bowl that have already been boiled for seven minutes held up. If anything, they look even nicer than they did on the plant. So you could eat these as a side vegetable just like that if you wanted to, or you could use them in this recipe that's in my book, Milkweed Egg Puff. Uh, the buds work really well on that. And the pods are edible up to an inch long. You boil them for seven minutes and the flavor and the texture is really similar to green beans. All right, though, but here is the monarch butterfly caterpillar to remind us that, yes, this is an ecologically very important native species that we need to make sure there's a lot of milkweed around for the monarchs to find all they need. So this is a plant I'm actively propagating my nursery. I'm uh, planting it out on some of my sites. And, uh, and I've also got it growing right at my house. So I just want to quickly tell you this story about how I'm giving back to the monarchs in gratitude for also enjoying some of the milkweed plants. So here's my house back here, here's my car, here's my boat, and then here is uh, some high bush blueberries we planted along the side of our driveway. And we've also allowed the common milkweed, the only edible milkweed to grow there. And we just uh, eat it and harvest it. We also dig up some of those milkweeds and I pot them up for planting elsewhere. It's a very robust plant, it just comes and comes. So you can harvest the shoot several times without uh, uh, in any way denting how prolific this plant is. All right, so at what point do I stop eating it? Leave it for the monarchs. What I do is I consult a website called Journey North, which is a citizen science project where people will plot the northward migration of the monarch butterflies as they're traveling north in the winter grounds in Mexico. So it's a map of North Amer America, which has the kind of like this rash pattern developed from south to north as the reports come in of the monarch butterflies getting up there. And as the first reports come in, the butterflies have arrived in Massachusetts. That's when I stop eating my milkweed and I leave it for the monarchs. And the monarchs have found my milkweed. So here's a monarch butterfly. So I've put the net over the blueberries so the birds don't get them all. And the monarchs still find the milkweed, lay their eggs on it. How do I know that? Because here's a chrysalis attached to our garage door that fortunately attached in a hinge where when the door went up and down, it didn't squish the poor little chrysalis. So it matured and one day we went out and this was empty and the butterfly matured and flown away. All right, sassafras. Um, this is a little bit more common in Southern New England than Northern New England, but you definitely have it uh, in around Nashua. It's an exceedingly easy plant to recognize because it has leaves with three different shapes, no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs all in the same plant. And there's two main edible parts. Sassafras root has that familiar root beer flavor and you can make tea from it. In my book, I've got a recipe for sassafras candy, which sounds like the root beer bells used by any candy store only even stronger because there's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. All right, but in the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that the Food and Drug Administration uh, is under the opinion that saffron, an essential oil that's in the sassafras root bark, might be carcinogenic to people. And they're basing that on a couple studies that showed that a huge amount of saffron fed to rats, some of those rats got cancer. So uh, it turns out though that our metabolism is different than rats and there's no evidence that humans uh, uh, get cancer from sassafras. I don't even know of a single anecdotal report of if human reported to get cancer from sassafras, but if all you need to hear is there might be a possible carcinogen in the sassafras roots and that's all you need to decide that you yourself are not gonna eat it, I totally support you in that. In fact, I totally support 
wherever your comfort level is about anything I've talked about tonight. So if you're not sure you've identified a plant correctly, if you're not sure the plant place a plant is growing is an uncontaminated area, or you're not sure a plant hasn't been sprayed with herbicides and you decide not to eat it, I think it's pretty sensible to be cautious like that. But there is a part of the sassafras where the saffron isn't an issue, and that is the young sassafras leaves. They are at this stage in eastern Massachusetts right now, so if they're not in New Hampshire, they will be very, very soon. And so at this stage, it's the stage to gather them to make filet powder. So of course, you're not going to denude entire sassafras plants. You're going to pick a few from this one, a few from that one. Bring the leaves home, spread them out in a cookie sheet, let them dry thoroughly, pul pulverize them, and then take that powder and put it in a salt and pepper type shaker and then add it to your food near the end just before you serve it to flavor and thicken it. All right, there's a whole chapter on cattails in my book. So I didn't make up this, this uh, moniker though, the supermarket of the swamps that came from Yul Gibbons book, Stocking the Wild Asparagus. So uh, I won't talk about everything that's edible on a cattail, but I just mentioned a few things here. So this swelling near the top of the plant, that's gonna show up in uh, uh, mid-June. And then when you peel the outer leaves away, this is what's inside. So here's the female flower on the bottom, the male flower on top. So you just steam or boil everything and the flavor is like a cross between corn and artichokes. All right, and then the uh, at the same time you're gathering those bloom spikes, you can be gathering the cattail heart, which is uh, when you peel the outer leaves away, it's very soft and tender in the inside. And this is like a cucumber, like hearts of palm. And even the cattail pollen is edible and hypoallergenic, by the way. So you can go into the marsh with a, a bag and just bend the male flowers into the bag and give them a little shake and this cloud of yellow pollen comes off. Then bring that home and put it through a fine mesh sieve to intercept any beetles or any other little twigs, whatever that got in there, and take that flower and add it to regular flour to make these gorgeous looking and very nutritious cattail pollen baked products like these muffins. All right, so uh, here is a photo I took in the Greater Merrimack watershed. This is one of the tributaries down in Massachusetts called the Assabet River, but this is definitely a plant that grows along the Merrimack River in Massachusetts, probably New Hampshire too. It is wild rice, in case you didn't know. And I have never gathered and processed my own wild rice because it is a lot of work uh, to do at a small scale. So you have to pick a big deal. I pick stuff all the time, but then you have to parch it and you have to winnow it and I just have never done it. So what I do is I get my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indians uh, up in the lakes in Northern Minnesota where they're still gathering it in the traditional way. These sticks are called knockers and they bend the ripe rice plants over the boat and they whack it with the other stick and some of the grains fall into the boat and some fall into the water, which is deliberate is that's the wild rice that helps sustain the crop and also to feed the ducks. And so this traditional harvesting method is also the most sustainable and responsible harvesting method. And so, yes, so Winona and Duke's uh, organization, Native Harvest, I usually get my wild rice from them. All right, here's another wetland plant you might not know. This is calamus or sweet flag. And the whole plant is kind of a gingery flavor, uh, a little bit too strong for my taste in a rhizome, but the, the heart of the plants, if you peel the outer leaves away, and around now would be the time to think about doing this, the tender part, Still a gingery flavor, but it's relatively mild. You can just chop that up and put it in a salad. All right, so here is the um, little leaf linden or Tilia cordata, which is a street tree. We also have basswood, which I've seen quite a lot of in New Hampshire, especially near rivers and on the edges of farms and stuff like that. Uh, there's two edible parts in a basswood. Right now, including in, in Nashua, the leaves are edible. They're nice and tender. They're gonna be lighter green than these leaves are, yellow green and just take the entire leaf, pop it in your mouth. In England, they call linden trees lime trees and they make these lime sandwiches, which are like the watercress sandwiches on the white bread with the crust cut off and they just layer the young linden leaves in there. So that's one edible part, but the part I like even more are the flowers and the flowers bloom around the first day of summer in Boston. So I would say maybe a week later in Nashville, maybe around the same time because the Merrimack Valley can get quite hot as summer comes on. So uh, these flowers have a wonderful fragrance and, um, and they make a delicious tea when the flowers are fresh or dried either way. And uh, so it's worth drinking, just enjoy the flavor, but the uh, tea also has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state as well. So it's very popular uh, tea with herbalists. All right, so this scene you could have seen several weeks ago when the shad bush is blooming because it's one of the, uh, our native species that is one of our earlier bloomers and that's actually the best time to pick it out in the landscape and see where it is. So you do not have to 
go way off in some wild area to find shepherds though, because it's one of our native species, species that's frequently planted in uh, parks and other landscaped areas. So, so you, you figured out ahead of time where the trees are because in June, or actually this might be called July berry in New Hampshire because the fruits ripen uh, in early July as well as late June. Um, the berries are purple, they're hard color to see at a distance. So this is a great fruit for stuffing your face by the tree. The, the berries look like blueberries, but they really taste like a cross between uh, cherries and almonds. They're actually related to both cherries and almonds. And so uh, fun one for eating raw, you can bake with June berries. Now mulberries are ripe at the same time, so I'll mix June berries and mulberries together, for example, to make strudel. Wild strawberries, uh, New Hampshire, you're very lucky because I see more wild strawberry habitat in Northern New England than I do in Southern New England. We do have some of these though, and these strawberries are small, but delectable. And the, the uh, and the leaves, you can make you make strawberry tea from the leaves, and the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently, when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea that you make from the leaves does taste at least vaguely like the fruit, and it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some strawberry leaf tea. All right, daylilies are edible with caution, so I'll get to that. Although I will I will guess that most of you on this uh, Zoominar have eaten daylilies. If you've ever eaten the Chinese dishes, mushu or hot and sour soup, they usually use dried daylily flowers in those recipes. So, and by the way, I'm only gonna talk about the tall orange flowered daylilies because I'm not sure about some of the other fancy daylilies that the horticulturists are experimenting with where they might've actually crossed the species barrier and mixed in some other species with some DNA stuff. And so uh, I have no idea if those uh, flowers are safe to eat, but these tall, wild orange ones that you frequently see um, in abandoned homesteads and stuff. This is the ones that are, that are you know, with this caution I'll get to in just a second, but uh, these are edible. So the young plants are edible. The, uh, the core or the uh, tender part of the taller plants, the flower buds, which you sauteed uh, in a skillet and butter for a few minutes, they taste like onion and green beans. Or the open flowers, which you can stuff like, uh, or fry in tempura batter. And even the wilted flowers you add to soups and stews and flavor to thicken them. All right, so what's the caution about? So there is a chemical in daylilies that for a small segment of the population, I think it's less than one in five. Uh, if you eat daylilies and you have this uh, sensitivity, you might find that you feel nauseous and or you have a loose bowel movement after eating daylilies. And um, it's something you'll recover from completely. You're not gonna have flashbacks later on or anything. You'll just know that, that daylilies don't agree with your digestive system. So it seems to be triggered mostly by the raw tubers underneath the ground, but the, um, uh, but it's possible other parts of the plant could do it too. Oh, so here's the wood sorrel. Sorry. So this usually is right after the sheep sorrel in my slideshow and uh, it got shuffled around. So yeah, so it's not clover. Uh, you see the heart-shaped leaflets on this plant. Clover leaflets are, are, are much more oval shaped. Clover is technically edible by people, but you really need multiple stomachs to digest it properly. So I don't usually teach it to people. And this one, um, as I said, it's tart, just, uh, uh, just eat it in moderation, you're fine. Okay, and then partridge berry. Um, these berries have virtually no flavor, but they're pretty. So I'll just put a few on top of the salad just to add that nice color in there. And then ground cherry. So this photo is out of chronological sequence too, because this is really a late summer, early fall wild edible because it's a tomato relative. And so plants in that family like the hot weather. And so they usually don't really get going until the weather gets hot. So anyway, this tomato-like fruit is always enclosed in a papery sheath called a calyx. So you see an immature one down here. So you cannot see this fruit unless you peel the papery husk off. If you're seeing a plant with tomato-like fruit on there, uh, it's probably the uh, poisonous horse nettle. It would also be a thorny plant too. So just stick to the fruits that have the covering over them. And that's the ground cherry. And they taste like a sweet cherry tomato. They're quite good. They call the ground cherry, by the way, because what happens is the fruit's ripening inside this calyx. And this calyx is going to turn yellow and then tan. And then the whole thing falls off the ground. And the ripe fruit is actually on the ground. So when you check the plants, look underneath the plants on the ground for the ripe fruit. All right, jewelweed. So some of you may know that this has been clinically proven as an antidote to uh, the rash and poison ivy. And, uh, but let's talk about the edible part. So there is a seed inside this seed pod that's edible. The tricky part is when the seed pods are ripe, they explode, they detonate, they shoot all over the place. So 
what you want to do is sneak up on one of these ripe seed pods and grab it and have it explode in your hand. Don't worry, it won't hurt. So that's a close-up of what a ripe seed pod looks like. And there's the seeds inside. So you pinch it and it does all this poppy business here. And letter D are the ripe seeds and they taste just like store-bought English walnuts. Um, and another cool thing you can do with these seeds, not to eat them, but just to see is if you gently rub this outer covering off the inner seed color is this beautiful, bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color is in there because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries in Mother Nature. All right, so now that the hot weather has arrived, we can look for weeds like purslane in our gardens and organic farms and stuff like that. So this entire plant is edible, above ground part of the plant is edible. So the stems are edible, the leaves are edible, raw or cooked. And uh, I'm going to show you a way that uh, a great way to use the person leaves that requires no cooking skill whatsoever, and that is to throw the person leaves in a gazpacho, and you don't even have to make the gazpacho. You can go to Whole Foods or some other place and buy the gazpacho, and then just throw the person leaves in there, and the texture of the person leaves works really well in the gazpacho. All right, so here is flowering raspberry. So this is a plant I talked about on the video today. It's one of the plants I'm propagating and planting out in my nursery. It's a gorgeous looking plant. Even if you never ate it, it's got these enormous maple-like leaves, these very showy magenta colored flowers about two inches across. And the canes, although you can't see the canes in this photo, the canes don't have thorns. So isn't that cool? And here's what the fruit looks like. Now I have to admit that a real red raspberry is probably tastier than these guys are because these are a little on the dry side, but, uh, but they're still perfectly edible and black raspberries. I don't need to tell you how to eat a black raspberry. I'll just take note that during the off season is when blackberry discloses its location even more than during the other times of the year, except of course when the right fruit is on there from this purpley color in the cane. So you could be out in February walking your dog, cross country skiing. You see these thorny canes with purple color. Those are black raspberries. And then you wanna go in late June, early July, look for the fruit. All right, so choke cherries are ripe uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, in the latter half of the summer, usually by mid-August, and these cherries that hang down in clusters of like a dozen or so cherries per cluster, when they when they take on a maroon color is when they're ripe, and they're called choke cherries just because they're really puckery that make your cheeks cave in if you eat them raw. But if you cook with them, let's say make a jelly from them, that uh, puckeriness largely dissipates and, and they make a very nice jelly. Here's black cherries. So black cherries can actually be quite yummy raw. They vary in flavor from tree to tree. So if you try a black cherry and you're not particularly impressed with the flavor, don't give up on black cherries, try another one. I've had some that are sweet and just about as good as a domesticated cherry in flavor, except for the fact that these are small. So black cherries will approach, but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter. And the pit inside each fruit is not that much smaller than a conventional cherry pit. So I wouldn't recommend utilizing black cherries for any recipe that require pitting each individual fruit because that would be exceedingly tiresome. So what I will do is just throw a bunch of the black cherries in a saucepan with a little bit of water and simmer them for a while just to soften them up, put everything through a food mill or a sieve, and then the uh, pits are held back and then the uh, juice and the pulp goes through. And that's the raw material used for making cherry cordials, cherry jam, cherry jelly, uh, uh, cherry fruit soups and stuff like that. All right, black huckleberries, very common plant. I'm sure a lot of people pick these thinking they're blueberries and there's actually no harm in that. Black huckleberries tend to be water and seedier than blueberries, but other than that, they're perfectly fine. All right, Indian cucumbers. So this is a wonderful wild edible with a couple things you have to be very uh, cautious about when you harvest it. Um, it. The edible part is the root. You see it down there. The root tastes like a starchy cucumber. They're quite good, but it's hard to avoid killing the plant to harvest this root. And so I don't ever even think of harvesting any Indian cucumber roots unless I'm seeing lots, and I mean over a hundred plants along a trail uh, before I think of taking any. Uh, and there's another issue you have to worry about because there is a federally listed species that looks a lot like Indian cucumber that you could potentially mix up with Indian cucumber. And here it is, it's called the small world begonia. It is an orchid. And you see how similar these leaves are to the Indian cucumber I showed you. So the botanical name of Indian cucumber is um, Mediola virginiata, the botanical name of the small world begonia is Isatria medioloides, which means looks like Indian cucumber. So how do you tell them apart? Well, you see on, a, on the more bigger robust Indian cucumber plants, they have this double decker thing going on where you have a whorl of leaves like that, and then additional length of stalk three or four inches long, and then an additional whorl where the berries form. 
And the orchid doesn't do that. It doesn't have the double decker thing. So if you're only harvesting the double decker plants, you'll never pick the rare orchid by mistake. Okay, elderberry. Elderberry flowers are edible, but I think black locust flowers are much tastier than uh, elderberry flowers. So I tend to just leave the elderberry flowers on the plant and wait for the fruit to form. So here is the ripe fruit. This photo is an upside down. This is what the berry clusters do from the weight of the fruit. I understand you can get a stomach ache from eating raw elderberries, but if you cook them first, you dry them first, it's safe to eat all you want. I like to mix elderberries and apples together, say elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is more interesting than just plain applesauce or apple pie. Sweet fern, this is one of our native species that American colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they boycotted the British tea. They just uh, steep the leaves in hot water for a few minutes. Uh, spice bush is another one of our native species that the colonists made tea from. They would just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. And the spice bush berries, I like to gather and dry and pulverize and make a, a Szechuan pepper or black pepper type spice. However, these berries are high in vegetable fats and the songbirds know this. And so they will seek out these berries to fatten up and fuel their southward migration. So show the forbearance and restraint. This is one case where you need to leave a lot of berries on the plant to make sure that the songbirds get all they need. And another cool thing about spice bush and sassafras is it's the host plants for this really cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So after the eggs hatch, the first instars, the first early stages of this caterpillar, it's trying to impersonate bird poop pretty effectively, I might add. And then it morphs into this form. These are fake eye patches. The real eyes are down here. The caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake. And then even at the pupa stage, it looks just like a dried leaf. So isn't it amazing how this organism has evolved all these ingenious disguises to avoid being eaten? All right, so this is a plant you should know. This is wintergreen. Uh, very common ground cover in the Nashua area. And uh, the berries do have the wintergreen flavor. They're not that sweet, but they do have that wintergreen flavor. And you can make a tea, like a sun tea from these leaves. Uh, but I if I want a wintergreen flavored drink, I tend to make it from black or yellow birch. And you just peel the birch twigs and that exposes the oil of wintergreen, which is in the inner bark of black or yellow birch. And then you take the peeled twigs and the peelings and then you just stuff a jar full of them with water and then you let it sit around for an hour and you get a really strong wintergreen flavored drink like drinking wintergreen flavored lifesaver. And yes, you can tap birch trees for sap, actually any species of birch, including the gray birch, white birch, as long as it's big enough. And uh, you tap them just like a maple tree with the brace and bed and the spiles. And you, uh, uh, when I did it on my family's land a number of years ago, I was getting a gallon of sap in an hour. So the trees really gush, but unfortunately birch sap is even wider than maple sap. So you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get doesn't have the oil of wintergreen flavor. It looks and tastes just like molasses, which is so cheap and so easy to get. My advice would be just go buy molasses at the store. Having said that, let's say you were camping during the time of the year where the birch sap was flowing and you were concerned about the potability of the water supply at the place where you're camping. And by the way, the sap would be flowing in April in the Nashua area in Southern New Hampshire. Uh, so you're concerned about the potability of the water supply, the place you're camping is you tap the birch trees and get all the pure clean drinking water you need it that way. All right, so let's talk about some summer and fall mushrooms. So let's start with the bad news. The risk of picking the wrong mushroom and eating it and getting very sick and potentially dying is pretty significant. And the reason is that some of our deadliest mushrooms, apparently there's nothing in the flavor that gives you any advance warning, there's anything to worry about. Uh, apparently they taste good. Uh, so you could have this delicious mushroom meal and be dead several days later from liver and or kidney failure. So, so yeah, so mushrooms are, are uh, um, uh, uh, you know, most poisonous plants taste bad and that rule does not apply to mushrooms. So anyway, um, so what do you do? How do you go mushroom hunting? So you could arrange all the mushroom species on a line. So here's my hands right here and clustered at one end of those species like the one I'm about to teach you that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous versus those at the other end of the line. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out or as you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. All right, so this mushroom right here is called the sulfur shelf mushroom or the chicken mushroom because if you just pull the mushroom meat apart, it looks just like the breast meat of a chicken. And what you wanna look for in this one is a pumpkin orange upper side. The underside is a bright yellow, like chemistry class yellow, sulfur color underside. It's growing on layers directly on wood, often in oak trees, occasionally in other trees. 
and it can be a live tree or a dead tree or a stump or a log. And uh, I've seen these as early as the first day of summer, but they can, I've also seen them in October, so they can occur anywhere during that range. And what you wanna do is just trim the tender outer layer of the fronds off. That will be the yummiest part. And, uh, and, uh, and it's quite good. And you can use it instead of chicken in recipes calling for chicken. So you can make sulfur shell paprikash, sulfur shell tetrazzini, uh, sulfur shell fajitas, um, all that works. All right, and I should just say the only lookalike to this mushroom, and I forgot to point out, important thing, there's no gills on this mushroom. You know how gills are like the things that radiate out like the spokes of a wheel underneath the cap of a standard store-bought mushroom? No gills on this species. So it's called a polypore is the group of mushrooms it's in. So the only lookalike to this mushroom is another edible mushroom. So this is a cousin, which is more pink and white rather than the orange and yellow color. Uh, equally edible, you trim the, trim the outer layer off here to get the yummy part. All right, so the French call this mushroom species trompettes de la mort, which means trumpets of death, but that's only because it's black. It's actually a totally safe, wonderfully edible mushroom with no poisonous lookalikes called the black trumpet chanterelle. And the tricky thing about, and I've seen places in New Hampshire where I found hundreds of these mushrooms, I actually got bored picking them, there were so many. Uh, so I hope that <laughs> I hope that experience occurs to you. So the tricky part about finding this mushroom is finding the first one because they're hard to see, they're black, they're small, they get to be about three inches tall, that's about it. But if you do see one, stop in your tracks and look around, and chances are you'll see dozens more, sometimes hundreds more. And a nice thing about this mushroom is that it dries very well. So if you do hit a bonanza and you find a lot of them, you can dry them and store them in your pantry and they'll keep for years until you're ready to use them. All right, so here is the hedgehog or sweet tooth mushroom, one of our uh, tooth mushrooms. There are no poisonous tooth mushrooms. So if you look carefully, you can see some teeth on the underside of this cap. It's kind of like uh, uh, the stalactites in the roof of a cave. So, um, so look for that. And there's, uh, they have the uh, hedgehog mushrooms have kind of a felty feeling to the top of the cap, and they often have an irregular shape to the top of the cap. And occasionally these mushrooms can be uh, on the bitter side, but they're never poisonous. All right, so the only lookalike to the mushroom in the center of this photo is a volleyball. This is a giant puffball mushroom, and that's not even a particularly large one. I've seen them more than twice this big. And puffballs are edible if they're smooth and white on the outside, and if they're very firm, and if you cut into them, it's white in the inside. You don't want it to be yellow or purple or any other color. And a standard way to cook a mushroom like this is just to uh, cut it into half inch thick slices, roll those into a beaten egg, and then in some seasoned cracker or breadcrumbs, and then fry it in butter in a skillet and make country fried puffball steaks. And that one mushroom could easily feed everybody in that photo. All right, so here is a Belitis mushroom. This happens to be the porcini, the Belitis edulis. So the characteristic uh, of uh, mushrooms in the Belitis group is that there are no gills. Instead, there's a spongy layer here underneath the cap. So on a young Belitis edulis, this color is white. As they get older, it turns lemon yellow. So let me just show you what that looks like. So there's the, the I'm sorry, olive yellow color right there on the mature uh, uh, porous layer on a Belitis edulis. And notice the color of the cap. It's very similar to a loaf of baked bread. And then the key distinguishing feature for the Belitis edulis is this stuff called the reticulation. It's this white uh, uh, pattern, very finely meshed pattern. It almost looks like somebody took a piece of gauze and they wrapped the top of the stalk with it. So the combination of the cap color, loaf of baked bread, white or olive yellow, porous color here on the spongy layer and the white reticulations, that is the Belitis edgeless. And this is another mushroom that uh, dries very well. So if you have a bonanza like we did on this day, you find a whole bunch of them, slice them, dry them, and then you'll have them for later. And it concentrates the flavor. All right, so here's a cool mushroom that I tend to see more in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but you could definitely find these around Nashua. So this is the beefsteak mushroom. It literally looks like a piece of meat hanging on the tree. And you see when I cut it in half, it's got marbling like a piece of meat. It has red juice when you squeeze it, just like a piece of meat. So, so far, my favorite way of cooking this is brushing a little teriyaki sauce on it and grilling it hot and apache like a piece of meat. All right, here's one of my favorite mushrooms. This is called a cauliflower mushroom. And I typically see this at the base of pine trees around Labor Day weekend. So here's a more recent photo of it. It looks like a big mass of egg noodles uh, at the base of a white pine tree or some kinds of other pine trees too. 
And when you cook it up, it tastes like mushroom again. Yours is one of my favorite mushrooms. This one I definitely find in New Hampshire, uh, usually on beech trees, often at eye level, like this photo was taken. This is called a bear so tooth mushroom. So the cultivated name of this one is lion's mane, but we do have it growing wild, especially in beech trees in New Hampshire in September. And, uh, and it looks like a frozen waterfall hanging on a tree. And the texture is very similar to crappy. All right, this is probably the most bizarre organism in the show. This is a fungus called corn smut that gets into the developing ears of corn and swells them up and uh, makes them look kind of gross, I'll admit it. In fact, uh, 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 it's definitely one of the least visually appealing things I've thought of ever eating. But you can see I'm quite excited about this when we found it because I had heard that this is a delicacy in Mexico. In fact, during the days of the Aztecs, if they found this growing on a plant uh, on, in a corn patch in Mexico, the peasants weren't even allowed to touch it. They'd have to send for an emissary of the emperor to collect it and only the royalty could eat it. So I thought, all right, it must be good then. So I cooked it up as you cook a regular mushroom, little butter, little onion, and I took one bite and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this thing? And then I thought, well, maybe I should uh, try the Mexican style. So I cooked it with some hot peppers, some poblano chiles, and there's some kind of chemical transformation that happens with the capsaicin in the hot peppers and the corn smut, and that made it taste good. All right, so here are hen of the woods mushrooms, also called maitake, and where you're gonna typically find these at the base of old oak trees. So the bigger and older the tree, more likely it is you're gonna find these. And there's a, another view of them. So you see they vary in color from grayish to this more tan color. And uh, a mushroom like this, uh, the outer layer is gonna be nice and tender and very meaty. The inner part might be a little bit too tough. So I actually like to harvest this mushroom at what I would call the chick stage, when it's uh, still only about five inches across and the entire mushroom is edible at this stage, including uh, the center part. All right, so if you've seen sumac like this and you'd be afraid that that might be poison sumac, you've been wrong. This is what poison sumac berries look like, these very loose drooping clusters of white berries. So uh, any sumac with these tight upright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So this is staghorn sumac, so the main thing you eat on staghorn sumac, it's actually you make a drink from the, the berries. And uh, uh, so uh, it's also the staghorn sumac, wing sumac, smooth sumac, all have these tight upper clusters of red berries that you can make a drink from. So, uh, uh, so you pick the berries off the plant and then you uh, uh, put them in a bowl of water and just rub them like you're kneading bread dough and you're rubbing them for several minutes to get the flavor off the berries into the liquid and the water will turn this pink or pinkish orange color. Fish the berries out, you're done with them, take this liquid, put it through any kind of a filter just to intercept any remaining berries, whatever might be in there. And then the liquid that goes through, you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. So there is the um, uh, roost juice or the sumac aid. And um, the entire time it takes from picking the fruit off the plant to drinking the drink can be as little as a half an hour. All right, so we've got a couple of different species of wild grapes that grow in and around Nashua. There's the fox grape, which are delectable straight off the vine. You often smell them before you see them. I'm typically filling my car with uh, baskets of these wild grapes, and I make a puree from them, uh, which I typically make into sorbet, but another cool thing you can do is make cheesecake from them. Then there's the Riverside grape, which you might run into a little bit more easily in the city of Nashville itself than uh, in the countryside. And these leaves are smooth and green on the underside. So while the berries, the grapes are edible, they're not as yummy as the fox grapes, but this, the, uh, the Riverside grape leaves, which are smooth and green on the underside, some people think these are the better leaves for making the stuffed grape leaf recipes. And the time to gather the leaves is June and early July when they're full grown, but still young. And then, yeah, you uh, stuff the leaves and, uh, and they're stuffed wild grape leaves are great. All right, there are no poisonous species of viburnums. I'm happy to tell you that. There are several that are pretty good eating. There's the wild raisin, the nanny berry, and the hobble bush, which you're lucky to have in Southern New Hampshire. We don't have this very much in Massachusetts. We're a little bit too warm down here, but uh, Southern New Hampshire, Northern New Hampshire, you definitely have a lot of it. So uh, the berries are ripe in September when they're black and the flavor, the texture is kind of like a stewed prune and the flavor is like a stewed prune, but with a little bit of a clovey spice added to it. So uh, they're probably my favorite species of viburnum berry to eat. And hazelnuts are edible and I have found lots of hazelnuts underneath power lines. And I don't think it's the electromagnetic radiation. I just think it's uh, all the sunlight they get there. And the fact it's hard for squirrels and chipmunks to work these bushes uh, where there's not a lot of cover to hide from the predators. So 
You can't, though, wait for the husk to fall off the ground because you'll never find them. The squirrels typically get them before you do. So pick them as close to ripe as possible and then um, uh, spread them on a cookie sheet. As, I'm sorry, spread them on a newspaper in your garage for a couple of weeks. Let them continue to ripen and dry out and then separate the nut meats from the shell. And then you have your wild hazelnuts. And all oak trees produce acorns. All acorns are edible. The just difference is how much tannic acid is in them. The acorns from the white oaks and the species related to white oaks tend to have lower levels of tannic acid, so less processing is needed. Shagbark hickory is my number one favorite edible species. This species grows in Nashua, and, uh, and there's a lot in southern New Hampshire and northern Massachusetts. So Essex County, Mass, Middlesex County, Mass, the two closest parts of Mass to you are great places to look for the shagbark hickory, but I've seen a lot just, uh, you know, in the area basically from Concord and Nashua east to Portsmouth. There are a lot of shagbark hickory trees in there and just go to a farmy area. You'll be riding your bike along the roadside and you'll just find piles of these shagbark hickories just right along the pavement. And in fact, uh, sometimes the impact of the nut uh, falling on the ground just bursts this hus off and then you just find the uh, shells with the nut meats inside and just gather those up. There's the penny for scale. And if you hit right here with a hammer and you don't pulverize it, but you hit just uh, enough to send cracks through the shell, more often than not, you get uh, the two halves open right up and that's how I'm able to extract these beautiful halves out like that. I'd be, I'd be uh, uh, misleading if I told you that happens every time it doesn't. It happens maybe 20% of the time, but the rest of the time I'm still getting pieces out. So what do I do with those shagbark hickories? Here's one thing I do is I make this maple hickory nut pie. This recipe is in my book. This is a New England version of pecan pie. And virtually everybody I've served this to, to say, this is even better than pecan pie. And were this to be a live program at the library itself, I probably would have made one of these cookies for you. Uh, like for example, these thumbprint cookies that are filled with this jelly called barberry jelly. And here's what the barberry I make it from. This is the common barberry, which is actually less common than the Japanese barberry. But this one produces the tasty fruits. So you see the flowers hang down in clusters. So this is what the plant is doing now or very shortly in Nashua. Um, hanging down like that in clusters of like 12. And that's how the fruit. So this has a very different look than the Japanese uh, barberries. And these fruit are very tart, but uh, they make an excellent jelly. All right, black walnuts, you don't have to pick these off the tree, wait till they hit the ground. And then you've got to get the husk off and that is a messy task, admittedly. Uh, and once you do that, then the next challenge is to get these nuts open. They're very hard. They will break most conventional nutcrackers. So you can use a rock, you could use a brick, you could use a vise, uh, like what you have in your tool shed or your garage. Uh, that works well. Here's what I use. I got this device from a company in Oklahoma and you put the nut in there and then you pull this lever and then the nut smashes open and the pieces fall into the tray. Now, I think shagbark hickories are tastier than black walnuts, just plain, but black walnuts are really good paired with honey as in these two dishes, the black walnut baklava and the black walnut honey squares. And at least one of these recipes is on my webpage, on my recipe page. Groundnut is edible. The main part that's edible are these tubers and they're edible year round. So anytime you can find the plant, find these tubers. And so far my favorite way to use them is just to slice them thinly and fry them in a little vegetable oil and make groundnut chips. Jerusalem artichokes were all over the Northeast when the very early European explorers, like uh, when Jacques Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence River in 1534, he saw patches of Jerusalem artichokes that the Native Americans had planted intended. But this plant is originally native to the Midwest. So how did it get to the Northeast? It's because our indigenous peoples of this region traded for it. As we had quahog shells or other things that appealed to the Midwestern tribes, and we got Jerusalem artichoke tubers in return. And it's very likely the patches where the Jerusalem artichokes are growing wild are descended from patches that were originally established by Native Americans. So this plant is now out of season. <clears throat> uh, uh, when the plant starts growing, it uses up the tubers to produce the flower stalks. So you have to wait until at least the end of September to harvest the tubers again. There's the golf ball for scale, so <clears throat> they can come in either of these colors. And you can use the juice of artichoke tubers most ways to use potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, fry them, mash them, and so on. All right, almost done, almost done, Carol. So we're almost ready for any questions that have come in. So here is an autumn olive. So it's just starting to bloom in the Boston area. Probably another week or so, it'll be blooming in Nashua. And uh, the blossoms have very pleasant smell. It's a good time to spot the plants. These plants are all over the place. Why? Because the highway departments planted them all over the place before they knew the plant was invasive. Now they regret it, 
But anyway, so you don't have to run into the median strip to pick this plant because it's pretty common. Like any place where there was a gravel pit, it's very likely to have autumn there. So I know some spots in the Nashua area where there are old gravel pits, where there are hundreds of autumn plants in there. Now, uh, uh, the flavor varies, uh, of the fruit varies from bush to bush. So let me just show you what the fruit looks like. So that's what the fruit looks like. Here's a close up. It's got silvery white speckles on the outside. So, and you see the fruit is often produced prodigiously in the branches. And so it's ripe when you just do these gentle tickling motions to get the fruit to fall into your basket. Uh, and uh, the flavor autumn olive varies. Sometimes it's puckering the streams and other times it tastes like a green Thompson seed this grape, although each of these fruits has seeds in them, which you can swallow or spit out, it doesn't matter. And so, um, so I will just park my bucket or basket underneath an autumn olive branch and they just tickle, tickle, tickle and the ripe fruit falls into the bucket or basket. And then I puree this fruit and then I uh, make fruit leather from it is what I typically do. Like what's shown here in this uh, bowl and autumn olive makes grape wine. All right, last slide in the show. So this photo documents a very successful foraging day I had in Central Mass uh, about 15 years ago. So what's in the photo? So I began with harvesting some wild pears, then I harvested some shag bark kickery nuts, and then I filled a big basket full of autumn olives. Then this basket, most of these mushrooms here, are the porcini mushroom, the Belitis edgeless mushroom I taught you. Now, this mushroom I didn't teach you in the show. This is an agaricus arvensis or a horse mushroom, and it is a larger version and a cousin of the standard store-bought mushroom. Well, you might be wondering what the barbecue grill is doing in the photo too. Well, somebody had put one of those out with their trash, and I needed one of those at home, so I just foraged for that while I was foraging for everything else. So that is my show. Thank you. And let me just say something about the book, and then I'll take questions. So Here's the book I keep mentioning. So um, this book um, uh, covers a lot of the plants we talked about tonight. Like there's the strawberry knotweed pie uh, and black raspberry, autumn olive, black locust, and, uh, and beach plum I didn't cover because you're gonna see that more around Portsmouth than natural, but uh, definitely grows in New Hampshire and the elderberry covered and so on. And the books cost 15 bucks, but I don't actually keep any of that money. I send it all to the publisher Essex County Greenbelt Association. So this is the Northeast corner of Massachusetts. So if you uh, head down Route 93 from Salem and you cross the border there, you're in Essex County, Mass at that point. And Greenbelt allows foraging as a permitted activity in all their properties that are open to the public, which is dozens of properties covering hundreds of acres. So I'm so grateful for that. I said, just keep all the money the book makes and just buy more land with it and create more foraging opportunities. So that's how to get the book. I'll leave this up for another second, but in the meantime, please submit any questions you have. And Carol, I'm happy to yield the floor to you for sure. your questions. And I'll just remind people that um, the information that was on that last slide, I put it in the chat earlier. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, I want to stop sharing my screen. You want to take over the controls sure. for me, or I can, or just leave the speaker up there. You can just turn my screen off. I, yeah, I you can just stop sharing. Here. Let me see if I can find it. All right. Well, you while I'm thinking of that, you just fire questions. Okay. Um, so Linda asks, is it true that all polyphores are safe to eat? No. No. Uh, there, uh, well, uh, there aren't any deadly poisonous polypores, but there are some that are so woody and edible, they probably give you a really bad stomach ache because your stomach would be completely impossible to digest them. So I wouldn't recommend eating the really, really woody ones. No, um, you know, for mushrooms, you really need to learn one mushroom species at a time. Uh, I hesitate to recommend any general rules for mushroom hunting because uh, there are exceptions to those rules. Even the boletes, which is a relatively safe mushroom family, a lot of novice mushroom hunters stick to boletes or, or you know, uh, polypore stuff like that. Even within the bolete family, there are some that, uh, could make you sick. So yeah, within the polypores, there are some that you don't want to eat. Okay. Um, and she also asked, can you recommend any books for mushroom identification in New Hampshire? Yes. So um, um, I can't remember if he wrote a book or not, but there is a guy mm -hmm. whose nickname is the Mad Professor, who's in New Hampshire, who uh, has put out a wonderful poster on the edible mushrooms in wow. New Hampshire. I bought that poster. I, I, I framed it, it's up on my wall. And, uh, and that would be a good thing to have. Um, uh, 
you know, of course, mushrooms aren't paying attention to political boundaries. So a lot of the same mushrooms we have here down in Mass grow in New Hampshire and the same mushrooms grow in Maine, they grow in New Hampshire. So uh, yeah. let me recommend a book from Maine that's quite good. It's written by uh, a guy named David Spahr, S-P-A-H-R. And I can't remember the title, but if you just type that into Google and mushrooms, you'll go to his site. And he's actually has a lot of good stuff on his website. And plus, you can order his book. And, and that's one that I think is very helpful for people that are interested in eating mushrooms like me. Okay. Um, and Deb asks, are there, do any of these edible greens have a similar flavor profile as watercress and could be used as a substitute? Um, uh, the answer is yes, there are wild plants like that, several. Uh, I didn't really include them in my show though. So uh, the best example of that is a plant called peppergrass. And there is a, a lookalike to it called poor man's pepper. And whether you pick peppergrass or poor man's pepper, they have the same exact flavor and the flavor is in the little seed pods. So in the case of peppergrass, they're flat round seed pods. And those aren't out yet, but they'll be out in about a month or so and they'll be out until the end of the growing season. And those flat seed pods, when you bite into them, I think the flavor is identical to watercress. Hmm. And I recommend those seed pods because it's a very common weed. It's a great plant to remember if let's say you've got company coming over for dinner and let's hope we can all do that soon. Hmm. And let's say, you know, they come early and they're starving or they come on time and the roast, whatever you're making for them isn't done yet and, you, and they're starving, you need to feed them something. So you can go out to your yard, find some of these peppergrass or poor man's pepper seed pods mix it with a little cream cheese, spread it on crackers, feed that to them, and they'll love it, and they'll forget all about the fact that dinner isn't done yet. <laughs> Great. Um, so Libby wants to know, what kind of soil does wintergreen like? Wintergreen likes acidic soil. So uh, when you find it under like white pine trees or hemlock trees, they also tend to like acidic soil. So, uh, and also wintergreen being a ground cover, I think one of the reasons why I tend to see it under white pine trees or pine trees and hemlock trees is because uh, under deciduous trees with big fat leaves, when those leaves build up, they might actually bury the wintergreen. Whereas if it's a pine needle, the pine needles fall off to the sides and the wintergreen isn't, uh, isn't uh, hidden. Uh, uh, it doesn't lose access to the sun when it grows under those places. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, Linda's asking, my hen of the woods did not show last year after six years straight. Do you think I over harvested or was it lack of rain? No, you didn't over harvest it because uh, unless you actually hacked away at the wood that the hen of the woods was growing on or getting its food from, uh, I wouldn't worry about it because a mushroom is analogous to an apple on an apple tree. If you just pick an apple, and you're not hacking whole branches off the apple tree. You're not in any way inhibiting the apple tree's ability to produce apples again next year. So, um, so a mushroom, it's the spore dispersal device of the organism. So uh, some people say, oh, you should cut them about above the ground to make sure that you're not disturbing the mycelium in any way. And I guess that's okay. Some people say picking them is okay too. It's just, if you leave the white thread-like mass that's living in the rotting log or whatever its food source is, you leave that alone. You're not raking the ground or anything like that. Uh, the mushroom should come back. What can happen though is um, occasionally uh, the weather can take a, a turn for to a dry spell at the exact wrong time for certain mushroom species. So the mycelia can be humming along nicely inside the rotting log, but if outside, there just isn't enough moisture to support the effort that the mycelia has to make to produce a brooding body, which has got a lot of moisture in it, it won't do it. So that's sometimes what can happen when you can see it for a bunch of years and then some year the weather conditions aren't right and there's no fruiting. Okay, um, and then Deb asks, are you allowed to forage in parks in New Hampshire and Nashua in particular without approval? Yeah. What about the side of the road? Yeah. All right. So those are two separate issues. There's the legal issues and then the safety issues. So mm -hmm. I apologize for not knowing the New Hampshire rules that well, but I did learn, uh, uh, fortunately, earlier this season when I gave a talk for the Forest Society, the Forest Society allows foraging on its properties. Uh, now, not commercial foraging. They don't want you going in there and taking everything and selling it. But yes, you can go there and gather for your own personal consumption, 
mushrooms, nuts, berries, stuff like that on SPNHF properties. So that's mm -hmm. at least something. Now there aren't any in Nashua, I don't think, but there are um, some not that far away. There's I one think there is one, um, the, the old Sullivan Farm, I believe. Oh, all right, well, good, yeah. good. So uh, I apologize for not knowing better, but that's at least one place. Okay, yes. so yes, I don't forge along heavily traveled roadways because there's brake linings and stuff that can come off cars that can accumulate in the soil and on the plants around the heavily traveled roadways. So I avoid foraging places like that when I can. I try to, you know, although, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, not far out, of downtown Nashua, you know, just some of the adjoining towns uh, like Hollis, for example, there's some lightly traveled rural roads where I, I wouldn't think, you know, as long as I don't see any evidence that somebody's been spraying a plant with herbicide. And of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, do try to ask permission if there is that opportunity to do it. Like, you know, I wouldn't pick dailies next to somebody's mailbox, for example. <laughs> you know, I would talk to them first. And the nice thing about actually getting permission from a landowner or a land manager is then you can really relax about the foraging, be very joyful about it. You don't have to be peeking over, over your shoulder saying, is somebody gonna you know, uh, get mad at me for doing this? So that's really nice. And, um, and as, uh, did I talk about organic farms in this show yet? Because, uh, uh, all right, so let me do that. So okay. organic farms are great places to go foraging. And I don't want to deter anyone from, patronizing the organic farm stand, getting the CSA share if that'll work for you because as many edible weeds and invasive species there are, um, there aren't enough to make a significant dent in our food supply. So we really need to be growing our food and organic is a great way to do that. But in addition to that, organic farms make great foraging places. So why is that? Reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Yeah. Reason number two is the way they manage weeds at organic farms, they do it strategically. They're not weeding every square inch every single day. They weed where they need to and where they don't, they let it go. And so if you time your visit right to organic farm, you can find lots of weeds, enough to feed lots of people. Then the third reason is that the wonderful living soil that makes the organically grown fruits and vegetables so nutritious to eat, all that good stuff is getting the weeds too. So the weeds that you're harvesting at organic farms are going to be more nutritious and bigger and luscious and Taste you, and then let's say weed growing in the crack in the sidewalk. And then the last reason is the edges of organic farms often have good edge habitats where there's fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, stuff like that. So my advice is form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds and want the weeds. So potential is great for partnership. So don't just go and start picking there. You have to talk to the managers first, talk to at least a, a staff person working there, make sure they're okay with what you do. And uh, I've never gotten anybody to say no at an organic farm. And I actually get invited to do a lot of foraging teaching at organic farms. So I think they understand this energy. Yeah. Um, and I was going to add that as in reference to Nashua Parks, I would suggest calling the um, Parks Department and they could probably tell you whether you can yeah, do sorry, it. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, you can ask them now. Um, I had a question. You talked about picking invasive plants, and I don't think you mentioned like what can you do to avoid dropping seeds or um, oh, I would right. think like pruning okay. a plant might make it stronger in the roots. Yeah, uh, no, I wouldn't worry about that. So, mm -hmm. so first, let's take the case of autumn olive. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I am picking thousands of autumn olive fruit every season, bring them home make the puree. So I'm sieving the seeds out. The seeds go in my compost pile. And uh, I don't even have a particularly well-run compost pile. It's basically a giant heap in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And um, and so thousands and thousands of autumn olive seeds have gone into that pile. And only once in the 20 years that I've been doing this, did I have one year, a couple baby autumn olive plants try to grow in the raised beds where I use my finished compost. And the rest of the time, those seeds are effectively neutralized. And every seed that I gather and dispose of that way is not a seed that a bird is eating, and pooping out that berry somewhere and starting a new autumn olive plant. Right, right. So, uh, and you know, some people say, oh, but the birds need them. There are plenty of autumn olives around, <laughs> plenty enough for the birds and people to eat too. Don't worry about it. Okay. And in the case of knotweed, I've heard people say, oh, knotweed stems can sprout roots and you'd never want to put a knotweed step down. So I've put 
uh, many, many hundreds of knotweed shoots in my compost pile, and I've never seen any of them develop roots and sprout. So I, I don't worry about that. The main way that knotweed spreads is through the rhizomes, through the little bits of root that get carried on a snowplow blade or get carried down by a river current. So yes, uh, don't dig up knotweed because then you're taking a risk that that rhizome that you expose is going to start a new plant somewhere. Okay. Um, okay, Scott's asking, if worms are eating the mushroom, would the mushroom typically be safe to eat? If worms are eating the mushroom. So I think what he's referring to is uh, a fungus gnats that sometimes, uh, especially with the Belita sedulis, the uh, porcini mushroom I talked about in the show, that's one of the profound disappointments that can happen with porcinis that happen during the hot weather. So this seems to be most prevalent during the summers. You see this beautiful big porcini mushroom, you cut into it and you see all these worm tunnels from the fungus larvae, uh, fungus ant larvae uh, going through there. And um, it just kind of matters how desperate you are to eat a mushroom. You know, some people, uh, if they see any worm tunnels, that's it, they're not eating that mushroom. Other people say, well, it isn't really that wormy. And so <laughs> they'll eat it anyway. You know, uh, uh, I don't think the worminess makes it unsafe to eat. Uh, in general, I probably wouldn't eat a, a, seri a seriously deteriorated mushroom because it's possible that it, other things like bacteria are hitching a ride on that that could uh, harm you. So uh, yeah, but a few worm tunnels wouldn't bother me. Right. Um, so Faith just has a comment. Thank you so much. This is my first National Public Library presentation event and it was such a treat. I will definitely be back for more. So you got Wonderful. me a new Thank customer. You. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? So you put my email in the chat, right? Yeah, it's in the chat. So um, yeah, so if, if you think of something later, just write me an email and uh, I'll answer it if I can. Yeah, and you're very easy to find online if you Google, if you lose the email address or whatever, but. Right. Okay, yeah. well, um, thank you everybody for coming and we hope to see you next week for Waterfalls of the White Mountains. Yeah, I hope I can go to that one, it sounds great. Yeah, sign up, go to our website, you can sign up. All right, great. Okay, thank you, Russ. All right, good night, everybody. Good night. Happy foraging. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>